Hello, and welcome to the York Festival of Ideas event, Music Prevention and Public Health. We will have two presentations today, first from Professor Norma Dakin uh, from the University of Tampare, and from Dr. Yoon Irons from the University of Derby. Professor Norma Dakin is a social scientist investigating the role and impact of creative arts to health and well-being. She is the author of Arts, Health and Well-Being, a Critical Perspective on Research Policy and Practice. Her current re and recent projects include the AHRC-funded Community COVID Study, the ESRC funded What Works Wellbeing Culture and Sport Evidence Review Program, and the Creative Credible Evaluation CPD Program. Norma is also actively engaged as a community musician, and for eight years, she has directed the award-winning Bristol Reggae Orchestra. Dr. Yoon Irons previously worked in South Korea, Germany, and Australia. Currently, she is a research fellow at the University of Derby, where her research focuses on the health and well-being benefits of singing. Yoon is also a singer, musician, and music therapist. We are also joined today by Dr. Peter Coventry, who is a senior lecturer in health services research with the Mental Health and Addiction Research Group at the University of York's Department of Health Sciences. He works across all elements of applied health service research using evidence synthesis, qualitative methods, and trials with a focus on evaluating complex interventions for people with mental health problems and long-term conditions. With partners at the Stockholm Environment Institute and the Environment and Geography Department, he leads on work evaluating the mental and physical health benefits of exposure to and activities in the natural environment, especially among people with serious mental illness. Peter is also an active collaborator with the Cochrane Common Mental Disorders Group. Dr. Coventry will join the two presenters and myself in a discussion afterwards about how music might be able to help prevent public health issues in the final part of today's event. So without further ado, I welcome Professor Dakin to begin her presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Craig, for the, that introduction. I'm just going to share my screen. So I think many people listening may currently be working in public health, but for those who aren't familiar with, with public health, um, public health is concerned with prevention and protection of populations, not just sort of disease and cure of individuals. And so it's a branch of medicine, but it's also a much broader interdisciplinary workforce that extends to those delivering community and care services and education and arts as well. So public health is concerned with physical and mental health conditions, um, but also well-being, I think, has come to the fore in public health in recent years. And many of you out there may be working in well-being, but for those who aren't familiar, with the concept, you know, there are different kinds of well-being that we might be interested in in the context of today's discussion. So there's hedonic well-being, which is about really happiness in the moment, and there's also eudaimonic well-being, which is more connected with ideas about meaning and purpose. And well-being is an important end in itself, of course, but it's also connected with a wide range of other health and social outcomes. So why are we talking about music and public health? Well, I think this discussion sits within the context of a, a much longer term discussion 
about the arts, health and well-being, which has developed kind of more formally over the last 20 years or so. So centres such as the Sydney de Haan Centre at Canterbury Christchurch University have dedicated research programmes on singing and health. Um, and there's a recent scoping review by the World Health Organization written by Daisy Fancourt, which brings together a very broad picture of research in this top in this area. And it really shows the breadth and complexity of interactions between music and health. So we know about physiological effects, such as the effects of singing on breathing, also playing an instrument, and also listening to music can affect things like um, breathing and heart rate, um, blood pressure, and you know there, there are many, many applications of that, both in hospitals and care settings and in the community. There are also psychological effects of, on mood and social impacts, which I'll be talking about today, such as bonding and connection. So we've looked at some of the well-being evidence in our systematic review programme for the What Works Centre for Wellbeing. This is a programme uh, with Louise, Louise Mansfield at Brunel University. And we did a really quite extensive systematic review of music and singing, and we looked at some of the findings, some of the best evidence. And it's very difficult to get really good evidence in this field because it doesn't lend itself to necessarily to traditional kind of randomized trial designs that you see in, in, in medicine. But we have got some, we are, areas of evidence where we can be quite confident. So I think the area of mental well-being and prevention of depression, there's some good evidence there for work with older people particularly, and also effects of music on mood and anxiety and purpose in young people and people from marginalised communities. And we're also interested in the qualitative themes, so the processes that shape the well-being outcomes. It's not just what works, but also how and why it works and for whom. And we followed this up in our work on loneliness, uh, led by, again, Louise Bansfield as part of the What Works Centre. And we've seen the importance of wellbeing in the pandemic and also the importance of arts for so many people as a kind of response and the coping. Um, but we also have to acknowledge that the arts have been badly hit by the pandemic and activities such as group singing which we know has documented well-being benefits are really effect affected currently by the restrictions. So within public health, there's also a focus on the social determinants of health, not just individual characteristics, but social conditions such as housing, environment, employment, income, living and working conditions. And we've seen how the pandemic has compounded health and well-being inequalities. And there's also a connection here with the arts. So it's important to acknowledge that that connection doesn't always go in favour of addressing wellbeing inequalities. So we know that people who are most likely to engage in the arts tend to be better off, uh, tend to have received more education, generally coming from higher income groups. So this leads really us to consider terms such as social and cultural capital in public health contexts. So these two there are different approaches to social capital. Uh, there's Putnam's approach, which suggests that arts engagement can increase bonding and help to form bridges between communities. And then there's also the more critical approach of Bourdieu, showing how arts are often used to demonstrate taste and reinforce distinction by powerful, powerful groups and kind of reinforce inequalities. So in our research, we've used both of these concepts. Uh, for example, in our recent review of loneliness and well-being, we saw that bonding clearly does take place in arts and music projects by promoting connection, social support, um, a sense of belonging and identity. And bridging also takes place through mechanisms such as sharing information, extending networks and connecting communities. But there are many challenges to delivering arts and music activities more equitably, such as building trust. Arts and music projects are microcosms of society, so divisions based on class, ethnicity, gender, sexual identity, and also political allegiances are present. And there are also some kind of creative risks, if you like, such as romanticizing community identities, 
or putting too much emphasis on nostalgia and an idealised version of the past and heritage rather than addressing current problems. So some people have argued that bonding and bridging needs to extend to linking social capital if real change is to be achieved. And in arts context, this means reframing issues, challenging power holders, fostering citizenship, promoting a sense of rights and empowerment. That can lead to a kind of political engagement or what we might call a socially engaged arts practice, which goes far beyond traditional notions of arts as therapy. And then finally, I wanted to talk about uh, something that as I've given attention to recently, which is social movement theory, because I think that helps us to understand quite a lot of these broader kind of contextual issues. So social movement theory addresses how we can build bottom-up grassroots responses to shared problems in society. This kind of thinking is embedded in some recent health policies, such as asset-based approaches like social prescribing, which often try to seek to extend the well-being benefits of art to the most disadvantaged people in society. I think the take-home message for me out of all of this is the need to invest in the asset base itself, which is the arts and the music in the community. So this means supporting local communities and grassroots level activities rather than see, simply seeing these as a supply of energy to address problems identified by power holders. So that's my brief kind of introduction. I hope that's helpful and I look forward to um, hearing what you've got to say and also hearing from you. Okay, thanks very much, Norma. Um, and so we'll have the, like I say, we'll have the discussion after we hear both presentations. So we'll just go straight on to hear from you. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having me. Um, this presentation is based on a ongoing systematic review paper, which is uh, currently under peer review. And this was completed with uh, Professor David Sheffield from University of Derby. Um, so, um, in response to the outbreak of COVID-19, governments around the world have published their guidelines, including rigorous hand washing, respiratory etiquette, social distancing, and restrictions in movements and gatherings. Songs have been used to share key advice since the start of the outbreak in many countries. In the UK, the first advice offered concerned rigorous hand washing. The NHS produced a video clip showing singing happy birthday twice to ensure that hand washing continued for at least 20 seconds. One day later, Prime Minister Boris Johnson appeared on national news singing happy birthday twice while he washed his hands. The general public and celebrities were quick to suggest other songs that included public health messages. For example, the Beatles song, I Want to Hold Your Hands, has been rewritten to include the message, I got to wash my hands. And Matt Lucas, an English actor and writer, has rewritten a 20 years old comedy song, Baked Potato, into COVID-19 song, Aim Their Children. The Sensible Potato says, wash your hands, stay indoors, and not to touch their faces. Thus, songs quickly evolved from providing a 20 second timer for hand washing to delivering public health messages. Many millions have viewed this new version of baked potato since it was uploaded on social media. So I like to introduce you the song a little bit. Hello. Hello. Baked potato changed my life. Baked potato showed me the way. If you want to know what is wrong from right, you must listen to what potatoes say. 
you. Wash your hands and stay indoors. Thank you, baked potato. Only visit grocery stores. Thank you, baked potato. And if you want to have a better day, you must listen to what the baked potatoes say. Keep your distance, make some space. Thank you, baked potato. Remember not to touch your face. Thank you, baked potato. And if you want to have a better day, you must listen to what the baked potato say. Potato. <laughs> so yeah, I hope you enjoyed that song. Probably many of you have seen the song already. Um, so that made us think, what do we know about the research evidence about using songs as public health promotion? And thus we conducted a systematic review. We used relevant keywords into major databases and we looked at uh, all relevant publications as well. Uh, we included studies, um, uh, the empirical studies on songs with public education or uh, promotion messages written in English and the studies must be peer reviewed and published after 2000. Um, through these inclusion criteria and relevant keywords, we found 124 papers initially. From them, we uh, we 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 sorry, we assessed 38 papers were relevant, and out of that, we found uh, nine studies met the criteria. Uh, studies were from U uh, from the USA, Ethiopia. India, Laos, Nepal, Tanzania, and South Africa. The public health concerns included HIV AIDS, malaria, antenatal care, and oral hygienic. Um, five, the included studies employed diverse methodologies. Four, four studies reported quantitative data, while five studies were uh, qualitative. Due to the small number of quantitative, sorry, quantitative, uh, sorry, let me do that again. Due to the small number of quantitative and methodological heterogeneity, meta-analysis was not possible. Hence, we used uh, and the generative synthesis technique to summarize what the included papers have said based on their research. There are three main uh, messages or findings, if you like. First one was song interventions showed that um, they is using song lyrics increased public health knowledge. The second song intervention also changes people's behavior. The third, um, the third main outcome was also uh, papers discussed how to develop appropriate song lyrics to promote public health messages. So the third part is uh, the papers discussed how to develop song lyrics to deliver effectively public health messages. Okay, so um, three of nine included studies evaluated the impact of using songs on raising awareness of public health issues. Um, Sharma and colleagues introduced a song program in low literacy rural villages in Nepal. Rural communities were actively engaged in learning about health risks of pregnancy. And then they were engaged in developing song lyrics by themselves using those health messages to accompany well-known traditional melodies. They performed their songs at a song competition. Then six songs were chosen to be used with the villagers. Villagers reported that they liked the songs and continued singing them, sharing the messages within the songs to their friends and following the advice that they have learned. Uh, two 
a study is focused on HIV AIDS. Uh, researchers, a school-based program explored hip hop songs as an educational approach to increase health literacy about HIV AIDS in urban black and Latino adolescents. Students had the opportunity to listen to selected hip hop songs and engaged in interactive discussions about song lyrics and HIV AIDS prevention measures. The programs was well received by students and they enjoyed learning about HIV AIDS through listening to the songs that they liked. Students evaluation and a thematic analysis suggest that participants understood the purpose of the program and found it enjoyable. And, and further, in a suburban village in Laos, a well-known folk song, The Lamb, was rewritten to include HIV AIDS prevention messages developed by a government agency. And the songs were sung by a well-known folk song singers and recorded on, on a CD. Then it was di distributed to the um, residents. And uh, people listened to this song and participated in focus group discussions. The LAM song increased people's knowledge and perception about HIV infection routes. The participants expressed willingness to act to prevent HIV and AIDS. Residents identified the LAM as an appropriate medium to communicate health information. And second, uh, the second thing we found from our nine included studies was song interventions also changed people's behaviors. Uh, the antenatal study in Nepal targeted both health education and behavior change. Participants created their own song lyrics incorporating key health messages and they attended singing sessions where the songs were taught and performed. In relation to behavioral changes, the 12 month follow up data indicated that participants adopted behavioral skills learned from songs and took actions such as providing additional food for expecting mothers and resting and planning for birth and so on. And further, researchers developed a song based HIV prevention programs aimed at over 300 urban adolescents adolescents delivered by their peer leaders who wrote a hip hop R&B style song. It addressed specific deficits in students HIV prevention information and motivated students to adopt relevant behaviors. Um, students in the experimental school received a song on a CD with lyric sheets while students in two control schools did not receive them. The students in the experimental group had increased intended and actual condom use and more HIV tests compared to controls. In the experimental group, there were also significant improvements in attitude towards and social norms for condom use and compared, uh, compared to controls. And last, the oral health behaviors of blind children were the focus of a song program in South India. A specially developed toothbrushing song in the, in the local language was recorded and played to children and their caregivers. The song lyrics explained the details of good toothbrushing techniques to guide the blind children. The findings show that children's improved objectively assessed oral health status at post-intervention and two months later compared with baseline. Moreover, children who used the song for longer showed greater improvements in oral health assessments. The last theme of our systematic review was research-based paper discussed how to develop effectively songs for public health promotion. Um, again, there were three kind of messages here. The first, um, researchers reported how to develop an age appropriate and effective song about malaria for young children under five years old as public health prevention program in South Africa. 
First, the researchers studied how to teach young children, and based on their learning, they then developed song lyrics. And music for these songs were developed through workshops with local musicians and cultural, cultural experts. The song was then recorded and evaluated through an expert opinion survey with malaria experts, musicians, educators, and caregivers to ensure that the songs were appropriate for young children. Another team of researchers conducted content analysis of 23 songs developed by the Ethiopian National AIDS Resource Center using a thematic approach, song phrases or rhythm and verses were analyzed in relation to the preventative messages. This yields 16 categories of preventative information, including sexual abstinence, limiting sexual partners, condom use, and so on. Um, they also analyzed whether songs have um, how much, okay, sorry. They also analyzed the ratio of the threatening message and to self-efficacy message in song lyrics. And they found that one to two ratio is the best ratio. So not too much threatening, but more self-efficacy message the encouraging message in the songs are more effective. And further, researchers analyzed popular songs with AIDS health messages in Tanzania. Through interviews with adolescents, seven bongo flava, a Tanzanian genre of songs that were popular among adolescents and were widely broadcasted on radio stations were identified for the content analysis. The song lyrics contained metaphors of AIDS and expressions uh, illustrating being ill with AIDS. The song lyrics also expressed being ashamed, feeling ashamed and being isolated due to AIDS. Additionally, broader preventative messages such as um, being faithful and condom use were conveyed through the songs. They concluded that song-based public health promotion programs have the potential to reach a wide audience in an inexpensive way. So uh, in summary, what have we learned? What are the benefits of using songs? First, uh, songs are compelling and they can engage the audience by harnessing social and cultural relevant interests. Second, using traditional songs can help overcome the literacy barriers. As, you, um, as I explained, uh, studies are from rural Nepal, rural villages, you know, uh, rural communities where probably the literacy is quite low but yet using traditional songs culturally relevant songs you could spread the public health messages and also um, developing songs in partnership with local communities refocuses power to those communities and possibly away the public health officials and empowering these communities seem to be also a very important message uh, that the research-based papers all presented. And further, the economic benefits of using songs is also compelling. As you can imagine, um, compared with traditional methods such as leaflets, letters, signage or posters, song may require less resources and can be spread widely in a very short period of time particularly through now the social media, TV and radios. So in conclusion, songs can be an effective public health strategy in raising awareness and changing behaviors. The current evidence is limited by the small number of available studies and the study's heterogeneity. But given the advantages of using songs as public health strategies, further research with robust methodology is required. So we recommend public health agencies to utilize songs as part of public health promotion and education. Uh, this is the list of references. And thank you very much for listening.
Thanks very much, Yoon. Uh, okay, so that concludes the presentations from, from uh, both uh, Norma and Yoon. Um, and so I'd just like to invite, first of all, uh, Pete into the conversation, just to um, respond from your particular perspective and, uh, and, and expertise about what you've heard and seen from both of these presentations in any which way that you want to respond for now. Thanks. Thank you, Greg, and thank you, Norma and Yoon, for those two very insightful uh, presentations. Uh, I, was, I was immediately struck uh, in Norma's uh, presentation uh, when she mentioned the, the, the role of the arts uh, as a social movement and how grassroots organisations can be involved in, in, in providing opportunities for people to engage in the arts and music in general. And, and, and you mentioned Norma social prescribing. And as we know, social prescribing has taken off in a big way in England and, and it's going to be scaled up over the next number of years. Uh, and lots of people are being uh, signposted for, 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 for non-medical advice for, for a whole bunch of reasons like debt, housing, mental health. Uh, and I just wondered how how are arts-based organisations placed to respond to the opportunity to to provide uh, non-medical and non-clinical uh, support for people with, for example, mental health problems? Uh, you, you mentioned funding is a big issue, and of course, a lot a lot of the arts-based organisations, I guess, are provided in the community by voluntary sector and, and, and social enterprise companies uh, where funding is, is, is at a premium. So I guess there's that tension of the opportunity here to, to, to sort of uh, uh, signpost and prescribe music almost on prescription, but then perhaps a, 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 a gap in terms of service provision in the community. Thanks, Pete, that is such an important topic and there's just so many dimensions to it so you asked about whether arts organizations are well placed mm. to respond to uh, medical and health and well-being needs in the community and i think that the there are a number of issues that kind of need unpacking so one is um a question of purpose so i know in the arts organizations i've been involved with well-being has been very much an indirect outcome of what we do but you wouldn't necessarily put that up front as the the main ambition because people in my experience want to be have creative ambitions um, and want to join a project which has creativity at the heart rather than a kind of outcome based so that's one issue whether it's an indirect or a direct kind of outcome the other issue is evidence and how to evaluate those aspects because often these are very small projects, sometimes they're very particular to local communities. So for example, our, exam our Bristol Reggae Orchestra is, meets a whole range of kind of creative and cultural and um, needs within a particular community, but I don't think you could just pick it up and take it to Norfolk. Um, so there's something about specificity and locality and actually that's a strength as well as a weakness of many of these mm. projects. So I think there, there are questions of scale and propagation and we know that how social movements propagate themselves isn't through like franchising or kind of big infrastructure kind of mm. approaches. It's really more about ideology and tactics. And the idea, say, of singing for well-being is an idea that catches on and gets transplanted in one community and then in another, but each one makes their own thing of it. Um, so, you know, there are discussions in the arts and health mm -hmm. movement about how to address issues of propagation and scale, uh, because if you've got, you can't have a postcode lottery. If you're then talking about social prescribing, you can't just have, just favour those areas that already have a rich cultural scene. So it's really challenging. And I think some of the, the issue comes, for me, the, my approach to this is, is through kind of sector development. So, you know, we provide training and CPD for artists who are seeking to work in this field with a big focus on evaluation with um, Willis Newson. I work with 
uh, we do evaluation consultancy and training and that kind of addresses part of it and we work with public health england i wrote a standard evaluation framework for public health england which is evaluating arts and well-being projects so there are sort of issues of kind of standardization to a point that can be taken on board and a sort of quality assurance um, there's issues of fairness and equity and within social prescribing how we make sure it's an equal offer um, and then i think there's also a question of support for the artist because this is quite can be quite hard emotional labor and there's something about um, if you train as an art therapist or a music therapist there's a framework in place which is very focused on supervision support safeguarding all of those things all of those things are present in arts and health as well um, but more often the arts are more kind of small scale freelance um, often self-employed individuals who aren't necessarily given that sort of infrastructure of support development and cpd so you know what we don't want with social prescribing is just to kind of send people into situations where they're not kind of professionally equipped to deal with kind of challenging mental health needs without support so there's just a whole range of problems and challenges that you've raised mm. so i think the arts have fantastic potential in this area and social prescribing you know they're really popular people want it um, people don't want medicalized solutions also i think we also have issues with you know i could go on and on about this but we there are issues at the moment around kind of say trust and vaccine hesitancy and again, you know, the arts are a really good way if it's handled correctly to kind of build trust and, and build communities. But it requires resources, it requires understanding, it requires some level of infrastructure support, some level of capacity building without wanting to kind of homogenize the arts and say it's, you know, one size fits all. Yeah, no, really, really fascinating to sort of to think about all, all the sort of uh issues there in terms of addressing as you say how do we scale this up and, and and ensure that the offer is equal and 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 meets people's needs and and, and doesn't lose sort of purpose and specificity uh and i guess in a sense you you mentioned that i think you obviously in her review picked up on the fact that there does appear to be some kind of evidence gap here in terms of promoting the, the 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 health benefits of the arts in general and music more more specifically because because of the difficulties of doing, I guess, gold standard randomized controlled trials, which which would then be picked up in terms of uh, robust evidence, which could prompt policy and commissioning of services uh, on a more sustainable basis. So maybe I'm intrigued as a health scientist because that's what I, I that's my sort of go to methodology. Uh, how do we overcome that? Is 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 there a sort of a, a shift in, in thinking in, in sort of arts-based research about how, how we can provide that kind of rigorous assessments? Uh, and, and of course, you, you've, you've just, just done that review where there was only a couple of trials. I agree with you. It is a difficult area. Um, I, I wonder that maybe that's because people, um, people have you know, anecdotal evidences, you know, those um, testimonies, maybe in, 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 the, in the field of arts for health, those anecdotal testimonies can be quite powerful as well. And uh, perhaps um, for some, maybe that's enough. Uh, they don't need, you know, they don't feel there is need to do more. Um, so they just happy with, you know, powerful case studies or you know those anecdotal evidences but um to yeah to to show the evidence we do need you know traditional clinically randomized um double blinded trials but often in arts double blinded you can't do that um just it's not feasible because it's uh, the intervention is arts so you're taking part in singing or um, art making you can't blind them to say oh by the way this is not the intervention <laughs> what you're doing and so it's not like you know you're giving them it's not easy as uh, you know giving them placebo tablets um so that's the the difficulty that art sector faces as well um plus um 
Yeah, and then there's also funding problems, you know, to do a clinical trial, you do need to have um, funding and um, that's often very difficult for arts sector to get. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're not, they're not insoluble problems, though, are they? Because I think I think there's an emerging field in, in public health medicine, especially uh, of, of using novel designs to get around some of these issues. And I'm, I'm involved in work in the, the, the sort of natural environment and green space sort of a field where there is now a shift to thinking about how do we uh, produce robust assessments of these complex interventions. So maybe, maybe there is there are opportunities. If I just say that over the 20 years that I've been working in this field, there's been, a, I think, a huge shift in understanding of evaluation and evidence. And there are there is an understanding of the complex interventions framework. Mm -hmm. And I think there are increasingly a number of trials. Um, it's always going to be challenging, but I think there are that is definitely moving forward. And as I say, I've been involved in this four year evidence review program for the What Works Centre for Wellbeing. So we haven't been focusing on physical health outcomes. We've only been focusing on wellbeing outcomes, but we've done five or six systematic reviews of different arts and culture and sport interventions in loads of different settings. So there is kind of evidence out there. And I think when you're dealing with physical health in, um, outcomes. So if you can, you know, obviously, as you know, the, the more strongly you can specify an outcome, the more is it easy it is to research using those primary outcome type measures. And if you're dealing with a specific outcome like lung capacity or something else, which is very measurable, um, there are, you know, trials in, in that area. So I think it's it's in development, but I would say that the understanding is is definitely there of the need for it. Mm -hmm. And I think different interventions lend themselves to different kind of methodologies. And also we have different questions mm -hmm. that we need to know. So if we're looking at in areas that are very developmental, where we're not necessarily that clear about what outcomes we're really looking at, maybe we need more developmental research to really get to that point. And it's also in, to understand important to understand the kind of impacts um, the the kind of experiences of people within these types of projects and for that we've got some very good qualitative research so there's there's quite a wealth of evidence i think um, but i think the challenge is it's such a broad field there are so many outcomes that you could potentially want to measure and trying to bring that together into a single pro research program i think is very ambitious yeah, I guess also it depends on whether the focus is at the more therapeutic end of the spectrum where you are dealing with individuals or the work that you has reviewed where it's about public health, education and population level interventions and they are very different perspectives. And I wondered, you whether you know of any evidence and indeed the papers that you, you looked at, is there any link between the use of music and song that it improves and increases knowledge about a health problem such as AIDS. Is there any connection between that increased knowledge and the health outcome? So in, in populations that have had the chance to, to sort of hear about messages using music, do we see those actually impact on people's health and well-being? So for example, is, is there a reduction in, in, in sexually transmitted diseases because people have heard the messages? Yeah, yes, yes. So two of um, two of our, uh, our reviewed studies uh, did an RCT and they show um, they show that there were differences after song intervention in people's awareness as well as behavior. So um, and um, the dental study was also very very impressive the blind children adopted um you know the effective toothbrushing behavior after learning the song and internalizing the mess messages through song singing um so yeah there, there are there are evidence and um it uh, and as i said the songs can be cheaper than any other public health method and also through songs you can overcome the low literacy barriers 
Uh, hence, it seems mm. to me pretty good <laughs> using songs. Why not? <laughs> we mm. should be using more, more of song, song based interventions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, is, is, is there any work uh, showing the value of sort of co co produced interventions? Because this is the idea of public health messages, either it's a leaflet or it's a video, it's, it's still coming from the government. But is, is there any sense of, of, of people actually engaging in, in sort of co-producing music that, that can, can be used as public health? Yes, indeed. Um, so the two studies from the USA, they involve the young people in schools using hip hop or R&B songs that, that students really like. And so one of the studies also used uh, peer leaders, they called it. So they picked some students out of those, um, you know, hundreds of uh, 300 school groups and educate the peer leaders first and gave them the songs and to teach other students in the same school. And also uh, studies also uh, uh, in agreement of, you know, using local musicians when they when they made songs, they asked the local musicians to sing it and to record that and then broadcast it through their radio stations. So the, the emphasis is there are using mm. culturally relevant, meaningful songs um, and in engaging the local heroes, local musicians to sing. So that's the way to spread the messages effectively to, to many people. Mm. I think that last point really connects to what Norma was uh, discussing about mm. community assets essentially, and the specificity of, of uh, the cultural specificity uh, as, and how important that is to, to getting the message across to the community or audiences that you're intending. Um, I'm just going to jump in with a, with, a, with a concept that I thought would be nice to have a little discussion about. It just occurred to me as the three of you were discussing. Um, what, would, it, would it be possible to imagine um looking at music the level of music in a particular community as evidence of a healthy community in terms of the music being in that community uh as evidence of a toolkit let's say for uh, resilience um a, a way of connecting to others a way of uh preventing loneliness uh, and so therefore that in itself is what you would be perhaps doing uh an rct or a systematic review of um, just as an idea that occurred to me as you were discussing, just trying to turn it on its head rather than looking for the efficacy of music for something. It's the, it's the um, evidence of music in something as the evidence itself. I think, I mean, you, I can't imagine a kind of trial scenario where you would do that because it's how do you measure the level of music in a community? Um, there are many different definitions of that. But I think we do have some very well established cohort studies, especially in uh, Nordic Scandinavia countries, which do show quite a strong connection between cultural engagement at community level and health and well-being outcomes and even life expectancy. So we know that those things are linked. We sometimes have difficulty knowing whether which way the causation goes. So is it the, the cultural engagement that promotes life and health? or is it having good health and wealth that promotes cultural engagement? Um, I think there are some studies that have controlled for um, the kind of socioeconomic factors and found that there is uh, still a benefit of arts engagement. But, you know, they're very, um, they're not sensitive um, tools because they're measuring things at population level. So, you know, we, we don't know from that what kind of singing or what kind of music or what type of sort of community engagement might be going on because it's survey data but you know there are some really good um there's some good evidence from cohort studies and longitudinal studies which shows there's definitely a link yeah i mean craig i was just thinking as you were mentioning uh music in the community the one the one thing we haven't discussed and maybe it's uh, another talk altogether and another another chance to, to to host an event like this but how how people consume music and how they share music and how music can connect people to people and of course that's been radically transformed by the advent of digital media and the decline in hard copies of music and the absence of record shops on the high street and 
we know obviously music is is a very powerful uh, uh, phenomenon in people's lives from 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 teenage years onwards. So I guess there's a whole space there of work around understanding that the, the the place of music as a as, as a sort of a, a conduit that you know connects people to people. Yeah, absolutely, and I suppose the whole concept of community is is changing or has changed. Uh, it's no longer necessarily place based. Um, you have whole online communities, especially around music and, and art and things like that. So how do you even approach studying that? I don't know if anyone, if Norma or Yoon want to dive into that at all. I think it is changing, as you say, and I think research is maybe slower to catch up with these changes because by definition, research does take time. But the other point I wanted to make was just to make sure that we don't just sort of draw the connections in one way only. So we know that music and arts engagement can be beneficial for health and well-being, but we also know that it's not true in every scenario and that there may be some kind of risks involved in some of those practices. So what I refer to as kind of discursive risk, which is where music and arts kind of perpetuates a kind of discourse or a narrative which may be racist or homophobic or um you know class centric all of those things we have to be aware of and within kind of social media i know there's some attention there's some sort of moral panics if you like about what kind of gaming or cultural activities young people might be getting into what kind of values are being promoted whether that's actually a safe space um so i don't want to kind of get into a kind of moral panic position but i do think we need to have a nuanced understanding of this and it isn't just that music is like a medicine that we can just give to people and there'll be a kind of dose response relationship and it's always positive i think we're getting towards the uh, end of our event so and I have many, many questions that I'm sure many people in the audience do. Um, but for this, for the sake of brevity, I think what I'll do now is I'll just go around everybody and just see if anybody has any final comments or questions they would like to, to leave us all with. Um, I'll ask uh, Norma, then you, and then finally, Peter. Thank you. I just personally, I think I feel very privileged to be involved in this area of research and um, I can see huge changes over the last 20 years and also quite a lot of work to be done. But I do think um, it's a very fascinating and important area, so I hope it will continue. Yeah, I could, uh, I can only agree with Norma. Um, I, I think uh, personally and I believe music is quite powerful medium and it's um, perhaps there is no boundary within music and uh, every culture has music and I think music really connects people and we've seen that during the, the pandemic even more um, like you know people singing out on balconies because they could not connect with other people so they, you know, being out there playing music, uh, singing, they wanted to communicate, they wanted to uh, feel they are still connected with, with their communities, with the world. So um, I think the pandemic has shown that music is a very powerful, powerful medium for us human beings and perhaps part of our, our, our lives, our natures. So I, and yeah, I believe there is more potential that we, we need to research and find out how to use music for, for our, you know, public health and other health outcomes. Thank you. Great, thank you. And, and finally, Pete, please. Thanks, yeah, no, I totally agree. I think, I think uh, as you just mentioned there, the, the role of music during the pandemic has been uh, very, very important. And, and I think we know based on forecast, there's gonna be a surge in demand for healthcare in primary care and, and, and the current system won't be able to cope on its own without uh, the support of cultural and arts-based approaches in the community and I think I'm, I'm really intrigued about how, how we can uh, evidence that the, the benefits of these approaches and, and, and put these organisations on a sustainable uh, funding basis so that we don't just 
give people who can get to these things the chance to engage with them and we can we can make this offer much more universal okay that's that's really great thanks very much thanks to um all of the participants thanks to norma dakin Ewan irons and pete coventry for their uh, contributions uh thanks to the festival of ideas uh people who put on such an amazing event um, in, in difficult times. I think it's actually gone from strength to strength with this new way of doing things, uh, reaching an ever greater audience across the world. Uh, just before we leave, want to point out there are two other related events to this one. So if you enjoyed this event, uh, you can also find uh, through the Festival of Ideas YouTube links, uh, two related events on music prevention and youth justice as well as music prevention and self-care. So do check those uh, links out um, if you are interested. And that's all from us. Thank you very much.